All right. Well, I I don't know if this is going to work or not. I don't really care. I mean, you guys are lucky we're even getting a live stream today, man. I'm dealing with so much shit today. Wait, I do have an intro set up on this. Yes, I do have an intro. I actually thought about that. Oh, you did? <laughs> Here, ro ro roll that intro. Okay, here it goes. Welcome to Tech Talk 159, where there's going to be lots of lag and audio issues and buffering and shit, so just simmer down and enjoy the ride. And if you don't, just bitch about it in the chat until Coconut Monkey bans you. Oh, he's not He's not watching the stream. He's not He's not even going to mod for us? He's, down, he's downstairs dealing with that paint crisis. What a dick, man. No, no. Coconut Monkey is like the nicest guy, which is probably one of his faults. <laughs> he, is, he, he is way too nice. Way too nice for you anyways. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, for me, uh, yeah. So, so what's this What's this paint crisis that you're talking about here? Uh, okay, so I guess we're going to jump right into car talk, right? Guys, first well, of all, get out of the way. guys, you're going to see audio and video sync issues with this stream. Uh OBS is not playing nice on Skunk Works right now, and I don't have time to fix it. Obviously, I'm not at the studio. I'm at home in our guest room, which is where Skunk Works slash my gaming rig lives. And I slept in that bed. That bed. That bed makes a very good doghouse bed. <laughs> Actually, I've never slept in this bed, so there's that. Dude, it's hard as a rock, but for some reason, it's comfortable. It's not that hard anymore. Enough people have stayed over now like for the weekend and stuff that it's actually pretty broken in now. Oh, good. Good to yeah. know. Oh, I'm it's sure just, it's plenty broken, AJ. Okay, yeah, you like to bitch and complain that you know I'm I'm not a good friend. I bought this fucking bed for you. You're a good man, Charlie Brown. This bed I my last exists time. because when you were coming over the the last time, I was like, I don't want Jerry to have to sleep on the couch or in in uh, Little Jay's pink bed again. So oh I God, bought I was this thing. That too. I literally pulled out. I literally pulled out the guest PC. Remember, there used to be two PCs in here when this was I my do studio. Remember that. Yep. I, I, I yanked all that out so that I could put a bed in here for you. You're a good man, Jay. You're a good man. Okay, so if you guys saw in my ZL1 video I put up yesterday in the beginning, I talked about the fact that I am one of the featured cars at CamaroCon taking place in Temecula. Well, a good friend of mine who's also a service member in the United States Air Force uh, has a 5th Gen 2SS full bolt-on Camaro. And he basically was planning on coming out here and and you know his uh, wife's family lives out here in southern california so he was coming out here and he's gonna be one of the featured cars too in the fast tech booth with me and he decided in february he was gonna get the car repainted and it was it's repainted with with auto dip it's not that plastic dip it's like a higher end plastic dip i guess i don't know i'm not personally hmm. a fan of peel coat uh but anyway i just like paint it the right way or don't do it at all it's kind of the way i am and the base coat and everything looked phenomenal. It was like a matte, kind of a gunmetal-y black color with red flake in it. It looked amazing because because his car is like kind of based after Deadpool. Like he's it's a red and black car, and he was like a, it, he just calls it Deadpool, right? That's well, cool. now it looks like Deadpool because they fucked up the paint so bad. It literally looks like Deadpool skin. <laughs> so we have been downstairs all day paint correcting and sanding and buffing, and it doesn't look good at all. Like it it it's not ever going to look right because there are fish eyes and there are uh, runs in the paint and everything, and and we're already dealing with like some places we're burning through the clear coat before we even get it smooth and evened on top. So if you know anything about paint Jeez. correction then you know i am fighting an uphill battle that is that we are going to lose it's just we're trying to get the car somewhat presentable but yeah it's uh it's not going well so and then and here's the here's the other thing you ready for this he uh he installed his long tube headers yesterday drove it from air from uh tucson arizona to here in southern california straight through today so like six and a half hour seven hour drive okay he gets here to my house. I meet him here before he pulls up. I'm waiting in the in the outdoor furniture area, like where our little our courtyard atrium thing is with the outdoor like patio furniture. I'm sitting there waiting for him. He pulls up into the driveway, and the first thing I smell is oil. I'm like, dude, I smell oil from under your car. He's like, really? I was like, yeah, I I'm sensitive to that. I smell oil. He's like, I'm I'm sick of my nose, like in the cowl at the back of his hood, like smelling like. I was like, yeah, dude, I totally smell oil. He's like, huh, interesting. So. I back my car, the ZL1, out of my garage, and we pull his 2SS in, and where he had stopped, like, there was all kinds of oil on my driveway. I was like, dude, look, you are pissing oil everywhere. We jack up his car, we look underneath, the entire bottom of his car, from front to rear, is covered in oil. The bottom, oh, of, the, the, bottom of the engine, the suspension, the transmission, the exhaust, covered in oil. And uh -oh. so, what, he, what we figured out he did was, when he did his long tube headers and he put his dipstick back on, he totally missed like where the dipstick goes into the pan. 
So it was just shitting exactly oil. It was just shitting oil. That whole trip, all the, out of that hole, all over the bottom of his car. So the pressure in the crankcase was just blowing it out of the hole. Yeah, but he drove seven hours like that. <laughs> How much was left in the crankcase? Did you? I don't know. I, I so it measured empty, but the thing was when he measured it, it wasn't even going into the pan. So I was like, dude. So he oh, he shit. fixed it and he put it in, and he's like off the bottom of the low side, but his oil pressure and temperature stayed okay. It's just, I told him, I was like, dude, you know, you don't even know how lucky you are. If you've got any problems, they might not show yeah. up until later. You need, on your next oil change, you need to look for a sparkle in your oil. But, yep. so, yeah, what is, like, turned into the paint crisis I was trying to fix. The moment he pulls up, I'm like, dude, you're pissing oil all over my driveway. And I'm like, this is just, like, the never-ending nightmare of car stuff today. He is so lucky that he made that long of a drive. Yeah, yeah, no like kidding. That. Oh my god! Just, just, I mean, just the vacuum too of just driving down the road and having air flowing over the hole. You'd think it'd just be cu- pulling a constant stream out of there, like quartz every well, hour. He had the dipstick tube like in the hole, but it was misaligned, so it wasn't like the whole quarter inch hole or whatever it is was just wide open. It was like gotcha. mostly blocked. It's just it was enough for while he was driving at freeway speeds to just have it the you know, the pressure underneath the car just gotcha. carrying it to the back of the car. Well, I hope he doesn't later on find out that he's got a knock in the engine from that. I would, uh, but but I mean, it sounds to me as long as he wasn't like hammering on it and shit, and he's he's probably going to be all right. Yeah, that's crazy though. Panhead oh nine, Panhead forty nine EL says, "LOL, his next oil change should be right now." Yeah, that's where he and Coconut Monkey are right now. They went to get yeah. oil. They came by. They they gave me my Starbucks. Uh, he gave me Starbucks for you know that, that's all he, he's paying me to help him with his paint and stuff is Starbucks, which I didn't even ask for, but he um. He went. He got this while he went to get his new oil, so we could do his oil change wise here. But then he got the wrong oil. <laughs> so, so yeah. how are you going to correct the paint? Were you going to just sand? Were you going to just sand it down and like reapply the paint that he had, and then try to clear it again? Or? It's. I mean, he already did a wet sand himself, which was not a very good job. But here's the thing: his paint is so uneven. I told him, I said, "Look, I'm." It was really cloudy too. Like the pic- I should have prepared pictures to show it. It's oh, so shit. bad. But I showed you pictures, didn't I? You did. You showed me yeah. the one picture where, I mean, it literally looked like it was rhino lined. Yeah, it looked like rhino liner. Um, yeah. I, I, we, so I've got like a three stage paint correction because I have all the proper uh, paint correction equipment. I used to, I, I don't know how many people know this. In college, I did auto body. And, and so I know how to correct paint. But it's one of those things I keep telling them, like, dude, first of all, this is not like regular paint. Um, this is, this is dip. I have no idea how this stuff's going to react. It's super thick. And here's the thing on top of this is it's got flake in it. So what looks like fish eye and a bunch of dimples is actually the flake making it. Like the flake is supposed to be like 0. 0.025 millimeter, which is huge, freaking huge for metal flake and paint. It's got mirrors in it. <laughs> it's so bad. Yeah, I mean, we're just at this point now where we're just trying to get the car to shine a little bit. But either way, I told him, I was like, it's a good thing you called your car Deadpool because that's about the theme you, you got here. <laughs> I'm not trying to be an ass. It's just we're we're just trying to minimize the. Uh, no other you know. car should have survived that trip. Like honestly, I don't. Even, I my my Subaru is pretty hardcore, and I think if I left the dipstick out, it would just all the oil would find its way out of that hole. From Tucson to almost L.A. County, that is a long. That's a long way to go with oil just flowing out of your pan. Good good thing it's a Camaro and it has like eighty five thousand quarts of oil in it. If it wasn't the XI, Exxon Valdez, it probably wouldn't have made it to your house. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the LS3s had, but I know my LT4 has 11 quarts of oil. That's insane. Yeah. Guess guess how many quarts my my little Subi, my little 2.5 has? Five. It's five. <laughs> it's, I, I already knew that. It, yeah, and, 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 and usually you don't have to put the five in. You know, when you drain it, you usually have about half a quart stuck in 90 little little holes. You know, up inside of the block. And yeah. it never comes out because it's horizontally opposed, right? So you never have a part where the oil can completely drain into the pan. Yeah. So you're always you always have puddles in in the cylinders. The only way to actually get a full oil change on a Subaru is to rock the son of a bitch. Like yeah. that's the only way you're getting the oil out of the cylinder. Technoscope says um, fifty coats of clear. Yeah, they basically did fifty coats of clear, just all in the the one coat. <laughs> it's so <laughs> thick in some areas, it's not even funny. It's, and you said there's bubbles in it. So who, whoever hooked up the gun like didn't check the pressure or nothing and just caked it on. It's not bubbles. It's um the base. So the way this goes is they lay down a base coat, right? The base coat's black, yeah. like a matte black. Actually, all paint when it goes down is pretty much matte, right, until you get a clear on it. Um, wait, here we go. 
Jay, most of your viewers came in afford a GTX 1080, let alone a $70,000 drag car. Get back to computer stuff already. Shut the fuck up, Shader Aid. No one gives a shit what you think. And first of all, it's not a drag car. It's a road race car. And what my viewers can and can't afford is not something I can do anything about. So basically, you can take your pansy on ass somewhere else. I don't give a fuck what you think about my car. Second yeah, of all, Shader Aid. Second, of, second of all, when it comes to the, to the paint process, they laid down this black... Now, the black almost looks like a gunmetal, first of all. Like, the back, the black doesn't look black until it has clear on it. Then it gets really deep, right? Okay. So There's all the scratches he, and stuff, right? He sent me pictures of what it looked like when the base coat was put down. And it looked amazing. Then they laid, they, they, they mix up the flake in the next layer of, of paint, right? And then they spray yeah. the, the, the flake layer. Like, have you ever seen the way that, like, lowriders are painted? Like they, oh, yeah. They look like disco balls. But there's so many layers of paint on that. Yeah. But the thing is, they do it in such thin layers, like they layer it and layer it and layer it. The problem is this guy just did like heavy ass coats. And so every single coat like that yeah. was pretty much so thick. And the, the, the micron size of the flake was so big that they could never get the layer smooth. And then they just put like f four times the thickness of a standard clear coat on top of all that, which just sealed in all of that uneven surface. Now, what's going to happen if you have like, if you have an uneven surface underneath. All right, here's a perfect example. When you're looking in the water, right, of the ocean, you know, some water looks lighter blue, some looks darker blue. That's because the depths sure. underneath the surface are different depths. The surface is the same level, but you have these different depths underneath that. So that's what you're, we're getting with his clear coat is it doesn't look even because the depth gotcha. of paint underneath is not level. And that's what I'm trying to explain to him. No matter how much we wet sand, no matter how much we polish, no matter how much we, we cut it and clear it or polish it, it's not gonna look right. Because the base coat underneath is so jacked up. Oh my god! So so, said, <laughs> Jimmy says no tech talk. I said the word. It's paint tech talk. It's, it's in the tech. it's in the fucking description. Yeah, what does it say? Warning: is, If you ask technology. where's the tech, you might get publicly ridiculed. It's right there in your face, and you still ask. <laughs> uh, speaking of tech, I, I heard there was a little bit of a of a uh, uh, Bitcoin rebound, and then it like went away as fast as it rebounded. Yeah, Bitcoin's not it, it's it's not really following its trend of of dropping in half and coming right back to double. It's uh it's floundering a little. There there might be some hope here for Bitcoin starting to starting to stagnate a little. It's actually something I wanted you to talk about. Um Jay, your audio is distorted. Does my audio sound distorted like it's uh crackling? I mean, you cut out every once in a while, like ever so slightly, but it's like hardly even noticeable. I'm going to turn down the mic gain. The mic itself. You know, I bet you Windows is like turning up my mic. Let me look at that. Yeah, you're running Windows 8.1 on that machine, right? I, I am. That's a garbage OS. That is garbage. Oh, I see what's happened here. Okay, yeah, it cranked the microphone audio, and I want the Yeti to give me my, my audio levels. So let's do that. Maybe that'll be a little bit better. Ooh, okay. you got a little bit more bass in your voice right there. Ooh, bum, 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 bum. Okay, here's what I, here's what I want to do. I want you to talk about this so-called ASIC miner for Ethereum. Do you know anything about it? Uh, is this the new? Oh, I've heard, I haven't read anything about it yet, but oh, I know crap. it does exist. I was hoping Here, you me, would talk about it because we. Well, I can't. Well, because we we had heard that it was Ethereum was like designed not to work with ASICs, and that's why GPU because of the memory speed and all that is why GPUs are utilized. But it looks like, and you guys ready for this? The Best Buy in Montclair. If you guys know where Montclair, California is, the Best Buy in Montclair. We went in there the other day. They had both a 1080 and a 1080 Ti in stock at MSRP. I was like shocked. Ooh. So hopefully that's a sign of things to come. I'm hoping. All right. Well, let's see here. So right now I'm just trying to identify who I'm, I'm guessing it's probably going to be Ant Miner because they're always they always seem to be the ones that make the ASICs first. Let me go check the. If you guys know in chat who makes the actual Ethereum miner, I want to go look at it because remember I did talk about this on a previous show that the only thing preventing them from making an ASIC miner is that it would have to be hybrid because it needs really fast memory. It would need like DDR4 or DDR5 memory. And that didn't seem like that was that hard of a problem to solve. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. The Panda miner, B3 plus, Ethereum, Zcash, Monero miner. Okay, that's not going to be an ASIC. 1900 bucks. No, nope, that's that's just a computer. Uh, let's see. Do they have any Ethereum? I'm looking here. I don't see any Ethereum miners on here. 
Uh, let's see here. Oh, it was right after they announced Bitmain. Then, oh, Bitmain. Okay, let me check. Bitmain. While you're looking that up, uh, yeah. Shadow Saber. He said, "Yo, I started making my own racing sim. Was wondering what games you've been playing. So far, I've got a set of Corsa, and so far, it's been really fun. Um, Project Cars Two is infinitely better than Project Cars One in terms of tracks available, the vehicles available. Um, there's um, Grid Autosport, as I think it is. It's more arcadey, but it's still good. Um, I Racing is going to give you the most realistic." Ex excuse me experience but the problem with iRacing is subscription based and with the exception it gets spendy with the exception of the base tracks and cars they give you everything's like either 12 or 14 bucks it's expensive damn i keep burping it's like expensive um i have easily spent 1500 dollars on iRacing since you introduced me to it three years ago so it adds up a lot um, all right so i think i found it it's the ant miner e3 yeah i just i just found it hold on yeah wow, they actually are for sale right now too yeah, man, it really makes me. This is this is me hoping that this this is going to bring things back to normal. So let's see right now. So so it looks like batch one. So the, the the brand new, right? These are brand new. The units are actually fairly big too. So I'm thinking they might not actually be Asics. They might actually just be fully integrated miners. Let me let me check here. I want to see yeah. what the notes on the unit are because this does this doesn't look like a conventional Asic. It's 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 too damn big. Someone says, what about Forza Motorsport 7? Yes, you can play it, obviously, through you know Microsoft um, on the on the desktop. The problem is it's very arcadey if you're looking for a very realistic driving experience. Forza is really designed for controllers, and it's just not that realistic. Um, so, I mean, but yeah, I mean, it's a, it's another... It's, Forza's a fun game to just, like, build cars and go and thrash them. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, they are saying it's an ASIC miner. Okay, so I've got some information here. Okay, take it away. So so, so it looks like right now, okay, so it's 800 watt power consumption. That's actually a pretty steep power consumption. It generates 180 mega hash a second, which is pretty respectable. Um, as a matter of fact, I think 180 is just slightly less than what I get off two Titans. So that's pretty pretty respectable for something that's pulling 800 watts on a standalone. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So it is, uh, let's see, 180 mega hash a second. It does, They do classify it as an ASIC, though. They say it's the world's first. ETH hash ASIC miner, ordering a limit of number of miners available in China. You can mine Ethereum through cloud mining contract with hash flare or Genesis mining if you don't want to buy in one of these. Uh, mining metrics based on 238,000 giga hash a second. They don't give any specs on it, which is weird because they're calling it an ASIC, but they're not they're not giving any details. They don't even talk about the memory that's inside of the thing. But then again, you know, it might be one of those things where they're just trying to keep it a closely guarded secret and somebody needs to get a hold of one and crack it open. Can you explain something to me yeah now I, it comes as no surprise that i'm pretty stupid now i don't really know what the difference between asic miner is and any and a computer other... doing it or a gpu right yeah yeah okay i mean i know what so, asic quality is so of course i'm always confused by like what's the difference of an asic miner and i'm thinking of asic quality so and i know what asics are so explain to me what an asic miner is Okay, so the ASIC miner is literally a piece of hardware that is designed just to do the one hashing algorithm and nothing else. There's no overhead. There's no additional instructions. Um, it doesn't have programmable chips on it, so it's not having to go through any kind of a logic chain to figure it out. It's like if you had a calculator that was hardware, basically, that only did one mathematical function over and over again, it would be way faster than having something that had to have software logic built into it to do it. Yeah. So, so the idea with the ASIC is you basically have a piece of hardware where you feed it a number – or feed it a set of numbers or a set of data, and it processes it through a chain that only processes the data in a very mechanical way. It's digital, but it's doing it in a mechanical way as it only handles the data in one possible way. So it moves really fast and can cycle way faster than a conventional chip, like like uh, like an x86 or x64 chip that has, you know, a ton of instructions and has to go through, you know, 30 or 40 different cycles on the CPU to do some very simple operation. The ASIC just does it all in one operation. Mm hmm so, so it can do it incredibly fast, and it's it's pretty much the most efficient way that you can do any kind of mathematical computation. Now, that was great for, for doing Bitcoin mining because Bitcoin mining just required you to literally guess a number. It would give you something called a seed, and you would use that seed in this very specific algorithm to generate numbers. And the per first person to generate a number with so many leading zeros randomly – basically won the coin so it was it was all it was all just basically the lottery ethereum works a little differently because ethereum generates these tables in real time like huge lookup tables of these numbers and it requires a shitload of memory to do that and the more memory it has the faster the operation is so now what the asic has to do is the asic has to get its data and process it out of these tables that are dynamically generated and the gpu was really quick at doing that because of how fast the memory was it really didn't matter how fast the gpu was it was more about the memory on it 
So then how come in the beginning everyone was saying you can't mine Ethereum on an ASIC because it's designed not to and now suddenly they're doing it? Because everybody was making the incorrect assumption that the thing would have to be 100% an ASIC. Oh, okay. This is not 100% an ASIC. Obviously, if it has memory somewhere inside of this ASIC build is some kind of chip in really fast memory that's capable of building the tables and all the ASIC is doing is the math. Yeah. So so it's a hybrid solution any way you look at it. But it, it's 800 bucks, which is going to be way cheaper than any GPU that's going to be able to mine at 180 mega hash a second. So, so that's good for the GPU industry. Like I, people are probably buying these up by the thousands right now. I didn't see who said it. The comment went by a minute ago that the Ethereum ASIC is like it's too late for it to make a difference. I mean, why would that? Oh, no way. Yeah, no, I mean, no, no way at all. Like even people are still buying new generation Bitcoin miners today. Yeah. Even though Bitcoin mining is like pretty much under the bus. Um, as far as people buying them for home use, like setting up your own mines and everything, I don't see a bunch of people throwing away their GPUs and going and running and buying these things. But if you're running a crypto mine somewhere like in China, oh, well, I'm sure they're already stocking these things on the shelves and throwing well, everything else away. And that's what that's what brings the market back to normal is Correct. they just have to stop buying the GPUs as a tool because if there's a better tool, right, for yep. it. I mean, I guess the question is which which has the better ROI, right? You can't see a price on these ASIC miners. Uh, there, it's eight hundred dollars for this one that does one hundred and eighty mega hash a second. But but the what the past has shown us is that all cryptocurrency mining equipment isn't priced based on the technology and the R and D. It's priced based on its profitability profitability right. at any given time. So like tomorrow, if Ethereum doubles in price, this is now a sixteen hundred dollar miner. They they will adjust the price literally daily on this thing depending on the the profitability of Ethereum. So where does that place it in terms of its efficiency of of you know, what its hash rate is versus what GPUs can do. Well, it says right now, okay, so the price tag at $800, D3 miner is about as expensive as one pair of RX 580 graphics cards or three GTX 1060s. You aren't getting anywhere near the same sort of hash rate for that sort of money with consumer graphics cards. So okay. that tells us right now that because 180, like I said, my two Titans is having a hard time doing that. Oh, see, that sounds really high. It's a really high hash rate. So basically you'd need three GTX 1060s and then some. To hit that mark, so the eight hundred dollar price point is actually quite cheap. <laughs> Scott it's says that, Scott Knight says only the first batch was eight hundred, so it's probably already inflated. Probably. Let's well here. Let's go see. Uh, I can go to Bitmain's website because they sell direct. Right. Um, as a matter of fact, a lot of my mining equipment that I had for uh, for Bitcoin was from these guys. Huey's okay, skydiver so in chat says, "Who's making these Bitcoin cards? They're not Bitcoin cards. They're ASIC miners by um, Bitmain, right?" Yep. Yeah. They're of the ant miner. Ant miner. Let's see here. Ant miner. Let me find the ETH. They've only got one right now. Oh, Jesus. Okay. So just give you an idea of how much the inflation was. Batch one was $800. Okay. Batch two is $2,150. Yeah. Okay. For the exact same hash rate. So just like I told you, 800 was when they first came out. So now the Ethereum is rebounding and going up rapidly again, and it's not at rock bottom. Now they're, they're three times as much. Um, Wonka Willie says it's equivalent to six RX 580s or six 1070s. Uh, Bitmain released them for 800 risking Ethereum fork. Ethereum said not forking. Bitmain raised price. Huh. Wait, six 1070s? That's what he said. No shit. Well, fuck, I was way off then if, that, if that's the case. <clears throat> even but even at even at $2,100, based on what, what it costs to buy six of those graphics cards, you're still saving yeah. money by getting this thing. True. $2,150. And it's probably it, it, using a lot less power. Yeah, and the thing is, as people bring these online, because the hash rate is so incredibly high and they can just run 24-7 maintenance-free and they don't have all the problems that come along with having an entire, like, you know, uh, operating system and shit, uh, you're going to find that China is going to start bringing these things online and, like, oh, I, I guarantee you, as fast as Bitmain is making these things, they're selling them. Is it is it then is it then feasible to think that people might just go, well, the Ethereum, you know, ASIC miners are just too expensive. I'm going back to GPU. Uh, only if the ASIC miners become more expensive than GPU, and that'll never happen because Bit Bitmain knows they will never be able to sell them if they don't undercut the GPU market. Right. The, whole, the whole reason <laughs> for the thing to exist is to undercut the GPU market, right? More hash rate for less money, and that's what they're trying to do. So if, so if GPUs start going down in cost tomorrow, they will have to start artificially deflating the cost mm -hmm. of their unit regardless. And they're going to make money on it. I guarantee these ASICs that they're building don't cost them $100 to build these things, if that. Probably cost them like 30, 40 bucks to build these things. Chris, Unless there's a shitload of memory in there that's DDR4 or DDR5, then it's probably significantly more, but they don't say. Chris Kasperzak, Kasperzak says Vega's like yep. 50 mega hash per second. Um, so that means you need more than three of them technically to, to match that rate, 180, right? 
Yeah, this is 180. And you're yeah. doing it with 800 watts. I don't know what the power consumption would be on those GPUs once you factor in the system that you need around it to support there it. There would be a lot more than 800 watts to run three Vega cards, even if they're Vega 56s. Right. right. And power efficiency is kind of like the core they're, they're like of under mining. Under load, the Vega cards actually pull more than 250 watts each. Yeah. Actually, so. whoa. So so the so the Fartis said three 1080 Ti's is only pulling 162 mega hash. Yeah. So so even at 2150, these things are a steal. Like if you were looking to buy something to mine Ethereum, you would not be looking at a GPU now. You'd be looking at an Antminer E3. Okay. Let's let's change the topic here to CPUs. So okay. Junaid Kosa Hosa whatever. I'm sorry, I messed up your name. Uh, it says so. You like the new Ryzen 2 for editing, rendering, or other work? as compare with i7 8th gen 8700K and other high-end Intel CPUs. I think what he's asking me is if I think Ryzen 2 is a better work, <laughs> workstation slash rendering CPU than the 8th gen 8700K. In terms Game of- for poor people. <laughs> in terms of heavily multi-threaded workloads, the 2700X is indeed going to hand the 8700K um, it's ass as far as I'm concerned, but the 8700K is gonna have better single threaded performance. The thing is, that's such an argument that doesn't, doesn't hold up anymore. This, look, that was, that was a good argument 10 years ago when dual cores had only been out for a few years and then people were still coding for the single threaded optimization. And I think Jerry, you would agree that things are so much more heavily optimized towards multi-core multi -core enhancement now, or multi-core threading that the argument of, yeah, but Intel's better at single core performance just doesn't hold up anymore, where if you can get a 2700X, which is cheaper than an 8700K, to, to, to give you perspective here, 8700K is six core, 12 threads, mainstream CPU. It hits about 4.5 to 4.7 gigahertz, and it runs really freaking hot because it's like, it's like the... Um, it's like the Haswell edition all over again, where they just did a very poor job of putting the thermal paste on, or they used bad, okay. you know, wrong thermal paste that's got longer life but gives you terrible temperature in between. They'll run upper 80s to low 90s under load. And so you can get an eight core 16 thread. So you've got four additional work threads with okay. the 2700X that's cheaper, it's cooler, and uses less energy. Um, so if you're doing very heavily multi uh, multi threaded workloads or running multiple programs at a time, I would rather take the more cores, more thread, and maybe a 5% reduction in single threaded performance to have more cores. Would you, or would you would you not do that? The only, the I, I agree with you by and large, like if you look at somebody's average workflow, but there's still a lot of edge cases that are very dependent on single threaded performance. Like for instance, many of the codecs, like the H264 codec, or uh, is it 264? Yeah, the 264. Uh, the 265 is way better, but the 264 codec is still heavily single threaded. So it, you're going you're gonna to benefit hugely from having more megahertz versus more cores. However, the flip side of that is, is most of the stuff with games and most of the gaming engines that are being built today and most of the newer software like uh, DaVinci Resolve, for instance, in the video editing world is all more heavily multi-threaded. So you're going to benefit way more from the multi-threading than you would from the single threaded performance. But I do agree that it's like 5, 10 percent. I mean, 10 percent would be like astronomically the tops. You're not yeah. you're not going to see that much of a gap anymore. It's hugely diminishing returns. Like even if one if, if you're running on the one CPU and the CPU is 20 percent faster on the single thread versus having two threads that aren't quite as fast. I don't think you're going to notice like any huge significant difference in most of the stuff that you're going to do. Here's here's where we are. When I first started YouTube in 2012, August 26, 2012, I had an FX 8120 at the time, eight Old cores, school. four cores, eight threads, technically. Um, Actually, it was more like. Uh, anyway, we won't even we won't even get into the to the bulldozer argument of whether or not it's truly a, a an eight core, or four core, or whatever. Right? They were more of cores than hyper threading. <laughs> yeah, but the thing was, the cores were sharing L two cache, so it right. was yeah. So anyway, um, two cores per per L two level L two cache, and it was there was share between the two. It was okay, but it wasn't great. It did not compete very well with Ivy Bridge. Ivy Bridge 30, no. uh, 3770K was just destroying it in terms of IPC, single threaded performance, you name it, it was just handing its ass to it. Back then, you could physically notice a difference of taking an 80, let's, let's say an 81, uh, an 8150, or even an 80, let's say an 8350, right? When it matured a little bit. If you took an 8350 and like a Haswell 4770K, you could indeed, throughout 
your day-to-day -day use, notice the, the snappier performance of Intel. Right. 2018, you fast forward five years, six years. I don't feel that anymore. I can go, we have all sorts of systems that are that are up and running in the studio. We've got, we've got 2700X, we've got some low-end systems, we've got Pentium systems, we've got X299, 16 and 18 core systems, we've got Threadripper running right now as one of our editing rigs. And you know, when I move between them, I can't notice a difference. The only time I notice a difference is when I hit render on something, the time is different between them. But even the even the lowest end, like current Ryzen Gen stuff versus the highest end, in, highest end Intel stuff right now, it's like day-to-day -day usage, gaming, moving around programs, browsing the internet, I don't feel a difference, which I think is amazing because that gap being narrowed the way it has, has really made the consumer win where no longer do you feel like if you don't get the highest end CPU that you're leaving a yeah. lot of performance on the table because granted, I think a lot of people are aspiring streamers, aspiring YouTubers and stuff, but very few people are actually making a living off rendering videos like, like, like I am, right? So I noticed those difference in terms of render time, but when it comes to something like a two hundred dollar, you know, sixteen hundred X, which is a six core, twelve thread CPU, I cannot tell you a difference between the sixteen hundred X or the fifty nine thirty K I used to have, yeah. and that was an, and that was an extreme extreme uh, platform CPU. It was a it was an X ninety nine CPU. That well, is to me, this is like the best time to be a, a PC enthusiast. It just kind of sucks that GP prices are the way they are. But, hopefully, but, hopefully that'll come down though. I mean, I honestly, an ASIC being created is exactly what brought GPU prices down when Bitcoin was robbing all the AMD GPUs. Yeah. So I could totally see that doing the same thing here, like yeah. quick. So um, the one who knocks said the 3770K was better than the FX 9370 in IPC by a pretty wide margin. Look, the 9370 was nothing more than an extremely factory overclocked 8350 that was running fi almost five gigahertz. The problem is you increase the clock speed. That doesn't increase the, I increase the IPC. It, it's, it's, that's more. So you're talking about instructions per clock and then increasing the, the clock speed. Increasing clock speed does not give you more instructions per clock. Does that make sense? No. Okay. Because the me... clock speed is inherently how fast it processes the instructions per clock, right? See, I used, to, here? I used to think that as well, but it was explained to me by quite a few people that that is not the way that it works. The... Well, tell me, because I'd like to know. Okay, so... Jesus, I'm trying to think of an analogy here. Um, you got this. Eye of the Tiger. If you have 4,000 clocks... Yeah. And each clock can give you a certain level of performance. Adding more of those clocks does not give you more clock performance per, let's say, megahertz. Okay, you're able you're able to complete more tasks in that amount of time, but you haven't actually increased the actual instructions per clock. If that makes sense, it's like the amount of instructions that that one megahertz can do does not increase. You just increased how many increased how many megahertz you're doing in the same amount of time. So that shows the level of performance, but the IPCs themselves have not changed. Okay, so let me show you where I'm a little confused. Is that the CPU's megahertz is how fast the C the CPU is 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 cycling. Right. Each time the CPU is cycling, it's, it's the same its instructions. It's the same number of instructions. instructions. Yes. So it's the same yeah, each clock is the same number of instructions. Right. So if the CPU is running at 100 megahertz and now it's running at 101 megahertz, you technically would be processing 10 more cycles per second or millisecond or whatever the fuck it is. Right. So you increase um, you increase the cycles, but not the actual clock per cycle. This is confusing. I believe I, I agree. And this is this is <laughs> very confusing. This is where when I made I, I made the assumption one day in a video that overclocking was increasing my IPC, like the Internet lost their shit. That it wasn't true. Interesting. Interesting. So, no, no, I mean, and, and, and it's just one of those things. It's not a matter of right or wrong. I just I don't understand it right now, but I know that it's incredibly complex because I know that the way a CPU cycles also is inherently tied to its instruction set. Right. Like, for instance, the old risk processors. Remember, they were literally reduced instruction set. That's that's what risk was. See, like Joe Ogram says CPUs are super scalar. They super, su, su, super scalar, whatever. They can do yep. multiple instructions per cycle. OK. Well, yeah, because they, they have multiple instructions. Because each time the CPU cycles, you're literally jumping in between the time slices on the CPU, and you're changing the values in the instructions. Literally, there is a clock 
there's an interrupt that happens between each cycle of the CPU where everything says, quick, get your shit into the registers. And then the next cycle goes through and processes everything in the registers. And then all those values get changed through the register instructions that were called and then put into different registers. And then the CPU repeats and repeats and repeats and freaks. Load instructions, load See, information, process. And it's just doing that, you know, literally millions of times a second. Oh, there's such a good discussion taking place in chat now. Like now, now they are kind of arguing with each other. Jetto Black says clock and cycle are the same thing. No such thing as clocks per cycle. It's instructions per clock is what we're talking about. But what I'm saying is, so it's supposed to be like, Oh, I see what he's saying. You do this. Okay, no, no. Okay, now that makes sense. Rel Relo actually made sense. Okay. Up here. Uh, Re Re what is it? Revel, Revel Pathon said you do more with less time, but you still do the same amounts per cycle. You just do more cycles per second. So, so that makes sense. You're not changing how much work the CPU can do per cycle. You're just changing how, how fast it can do cycles. It. Right. That's, and I guess that's what I was trying to say is like the actual clock can only do so much and you increase the overclock. You're doing more clocks or cycles Got per it. second, which is getting you more data, but the IPC or the instructions per clock didn't change is what the that's, internet okay, lost its shit Now about. this makes sense. Okay, that's okay. where I was getting really confused. Okay, so yeah, the instructions per cycle are never gonna change because the CPU, even you're, you're speeding up how fast it's going through, but each cycle, it's still only doing the same workload. Right. Because that right. cycle is literally just processing and that's, the instructions. And that's why the through. internet lost their shit when I had said ah. that I overclocked for a better IPC and everyone's like, you didn't change the IPC. And they like, <laughs> like literally like, took to Reddit. <laughs> that makes sense. Cause you're not so. looking at how much work the CPU is doing within a given time. You're looking how much work it's doing within a given cycle. Right. And, and there, that's and not going to change. The CPU can only do whatever it's instructions that whatever the architecture dictates it can do per cycle. That's all it can do. Right. And this is why now, I could never, is, this is why I could never be a CPU engineer. Cause I don't even think mm -hmm. my brain is capable of ever learning like the deep engineering level of, of how a CPU works. Now, I think there was like a was a homologation between Intel and AMD where they both basically have the same instruction sets now, like like didn't AMD get all the MMX stuff and then Intel got all the SSE stuff. But the, there's still a gap. A oh, there a are some things AM that one has that the other doesn't. Well, what I'm saying is I'm talking about purely IPCs. Like if we take the IPC performance of Ryzen 2 versus, um, you know, the latest Okay. And whatever KB Lake. No, no, they weren't KB Lake. I don't remember what they're calling this shit anymore. It's too many lakes. So if you take the 8700K and its IPC and the Ryzen 2 and its IPC, there's still a different a gap between them. But it's like okay. it's like five between anywhere between five and seven percent, I think it was. Because the interesting thing is if it can do more per cycle, like in an optimal scenario, right? Mm -hmm. It's not able to do it with everything, right? There has to be a uh Pretty much you have to be utilizing whatever that thing is that that chip can do on that cycle that the other chip would have to do two or three cycles to accomplish. Hey, here we go. Ni if Nihawk just put it in a perfectly understandable way. IPC is the track size. That doesn't change. Your speed around the track can, ch can change. Okay, well, that's a, that's a fair analogy. Because the way I'm looking at it is if, if you can do more per cycle, then technically you could do more work with less cycles. So Therefore, you could have a slower clock speed and do more work under an optimal situation if you're utilizing it to 100% of its its capability. Right, but of course, in an engineering level, you know, about 12 years ago, we they took the path of let's just add more workloads and just we'll build the CPU sideways rather than increasing what the actual core can do. But I mean, that's why, look at how year on year, how much faster CPUs got, how much megahertz they increased, increased. Let's go back to yeah. 2000. It was, it was 19, like, it was like 1999 when we talked about seeing the first one gigahertz CPU, right? Single core, mm -hmm. one gigahertz. And I was actually working at Circuit City as a computer salesman uh, when we had like an 800 megahertz Sony VAIO thing, right? Sony desktop. Who remembers the Sony desktops? But anyway. Um, I do. And then I remember when we had the first one gigahertz and it was just like amazing. And then it was just like, next thing you know, like three weeks later, it's like, here's an 1100, here's a 1200. Yeah, shit a... picked up quick, I remember that. But but what happened when we hit four gigahertz and above? That shit just hit a wall quickly. Well, so... Intel sent out a statement saying that five gigahertz was the theoretical limit at which copper, what was it, like copper traces or something through silica could, could transmit. Like that was literally what they were calling the ceiling. And we've even kind of blown that out of the water with more electricity and more heat dissipation. Yeah. But so, we can't go any further. There is a limit to how fast you can cycle. I mean, literally the laws of like thermodynamics stop you from going any faster. Um, well, I mean, I, I think LN2 overclockers would challenge that. <laughs> what's the what's the highest speed an LN2 overclockers ever gotten on an X, X like an X64 processor? Oh, I don't know what the highest is, but I know we've seen 7.9 gigahertz. Jesus Christ. Yeah. 
But the CPU isn't going to survive for any period of time at that speed, right? Hmm. I mean, a lot of times they're doing it on single core because they can't carry that frequency across all cores. Although I do think, I do think Threadripper got like a six something gigahertz all core. Mm-hmm. But maybe I mean, that was theoretical on air then, because I, I I distinctly remember when I was working at Microsoft, the Intel sent out some notice about them when they started doing massively more multiple core stuff. Yeah, like like they were explaining that the reason they were doing that is because they literally could not go any for like five gigahertz was like the limit where they could go on maybe air with just air cooling. But they were like, we have to start going out. And that's when they started announcing that they were going to do everything up to a 30, uh, 32 core processor. I learned and that was like seven years ago. I learned uh, quite a bit when I had Kingpin come to uh, Vince Kingpin come to my studio and we did the yeah. LN2 overclocking with the, his his video card. Yep. I learned an awful lot about how how the various temperature range actually affects the the actual CPU. Like we he was he broke it down really well for me. He's like we can go he, and he was really good to the sense where he was like look at this temperature we can probably hit a theoretical max of this and he would be within 25 megahertz of, of where we would crash at the certain speed he's like okay let's drop it down now to he's like let's go negative you know 60c and wow. then we would and then we would drop it maybe like okay with that negative 60c we could probably hit this speed and we went low all the way down to about a negative what do you go like negative 90c negative 100c something like that and it was pretty it was pretty awesome and he was explaining to me what actually happens to different electrodes and, and different um, you know the, the actual core of the GPU under certain temperatures which is why we also had a heat gun pointed at the the output so a lot of people ask like what's a heat gun for because here we are pouring liquid nitrogen into the pot and we're controlling the condensation we're controlling the temperature based on how much liquid nitrogen we let burn off versus when we pour it back in because there was it wasn't just fill the pot fill the pot fill the pot if you do that yeah. you're going to overcool it and it gets too cold then it yeah. doesn't work anymore yeah. But a lot of people I ask, watched Travis Jank break a world record on an Intel CPU at PAX a couple of years ago. Yeah. And yeah, I watched that where he has to heat it up with the torch while he's putting the liquid nitrogen in it to balance the temperature. No, the torch isn't for liquid isn't for balancing the temperature. It's for creating crystals on the actual inside of the pot, which great creates more surface area. Oh, that's what it's for. So, that's it's, what it's, so for. it's actually getting it colder. It's getting it colder. And the thing is, if you pour just a liquid nitrogen inside wow. of a copper pot, Mm -hmm. then it just boils and and the temperature here's the thing so i had the 18 core cpu the intel cpu so you know 30 36 threads 18 cores that okay. i had the ln2 pot on pour the ln2 in and then it only got down to like 35 c under load i mean you can hit 35 c on water right are you following me can you no okay so we had we had the 18 core 30 36 thread cpu and, uh, and the, the LN2 pot on it. So it's just a tower okay. of, of liquid nitrogen, right? Yeah, it's just a copper. It's copper, right? Yeah, the it's tower? copper, and then it's okay. insulated on the outside. And then we pour it in the liquid nitrogen, and under load, it would still hit, like, 30C, 35C. And I was, like, really surprised. I told him, I said, wow, I thought this stuff was supposed to go negative. He's like, well, we didn't actually flash it yet. I'm like, what do you mean flash it? It's like, this thing got a BIOS? I was joking around, right? And he's like, well, no. He's like, now we got to hit it with the torch. So what he would do is we would pour the liquid nitrogen in, let okay. it start to boil off, and then we hit the inside of the pot with the torch. You can actually see this in my video where I'm sticking the torch inside the pot. Yeah, I saw Travis doing the same thing. I was assuming right. he was like trying to pull, like add heat to it because no, it's getting too cold. No, so if you look, the okay. inside then turns very crystallized and it turns white inside. Then what you okay. did is you just created basically like all of these just different jagged layers of surface that has now increased the surface area of the actual like pot itself. And you created a better bond between the actual pot and the atmosphere. So now when you pour in the liquid nitrogen, it actually it, it actually absorbs the heat out of the pot better. So then we went sub zero once we did that. So that's what so the, he basically used the liquid nitrogen to build like a heat sink, like a secondary, like a bond between the right, copper right. and the liquid nitrogen. Wow. Right. It was pretty awesome. But the heat gun, we had to point a heat gun at the actual display side of the video uh, video card, like where the display port was. Yeah. Because that section is extremely sensitive to uh, the the temperatures. So okay. if it got too cold, you'd get no display. Like your graphics card might be working fine, but the actual display, like the control of the display would not work. So we kept a heat gun pointed at the Shit. at the at the actual you know output side of the graphics yeah. card to keep it more closer to room temp. So there's so much that actually goes in, into LN2 overclocking. Yeah. It was it was really enlightening. Well, I watched Travis uh, grenade about seven CPUs to get the world record. Hmm. 
So when we were at PAX, and his world record's already been beaten again, but yeah. you know, it was with whatever the current generation of Intel chip was that just came out at that time. I want to say that it was probably, I think it was Haswell, or maybe it might have even been Sandy Bridge. It was a long time ago. Yeah. But but yeah, he'd put a CPU and he'd run it, and then like if he if he let it get too cold, it would fry it. Like yeah. and it was done. He couldn't use it anymore. It wouldn't post. So he'd pop it out and stick another one in there and try again. But yeah, no, watching people do that, it's like it's a lot more people. You know, some people think that it's just like, oh, pour the liquid nitrogen in, fire it up and go run your benchmark. And no. it's like, no, between the torches and babysitting it and making sure that you're putting in liquid nitrogen so it never runs out or whatever. And then preheating. It's not Did he a, do the preheating thing. Yeah, but it's not about pouring it in so it never runs out. It's about pouring it in at just the right speed to keep it at a certain temperature you pour it in too fast it gets too cold you don't pour it in fast enough it heats up too quick and remember it's very sensitive to the temperature range at the certain frequency that it's at so that's why when i broke the world record at my studio he was like yeah i set it up he's like but you very he's like you controlled the situation which broke the record so he was like i told him i was like yeah right you technically broke this record you held my hand he's like no you controlled the liquid nitrogen he's like you you earned that record as far as i'm concerned and then basically he wrote me an email like uh like i think it was like three or four weeks later and and uh, Jacob over at uh, EVGA was like, hey, Vince says he's sorry, but he has to break your record because I guess um, I guess it was uh, Galax was going after the world record. So Vince was like, sorry, I got to break your record now. <laughs> so <laughs> and he did. He, he broke my record. Pretty, and then the, well, you, and got then to the hold, you got to hold it for a little time. And then the Volta card came out and then just he's the only person right now that's really, truly like customized Volta to be able to uh, break record and overclock LN2 on, on the Titan Volta. Wow. So, a Titan B. Well, somebody's yeah. saying the world record was 8.8 .8 gigahertz on an AMD bulldozer for LN2. Guinness world record. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I I, know that somebody somebody got pretty damn close to 8 or hit 8 or something. But, see, that's one of those things where it's like, it's not about how much performance you get out of that speed. It's just reaching the speed that becomes the game, you know? Yeah. Well, the it, biggest problem now is CPUs just aren't that important. Like, we, we've had this conversation before about GP. GPUs are literally thousands of very slow cores that are very efficient at doing things. Yeah. And that's what future generations of CPUs are going to be. Hell, even Windows 10 was designed from the ground up to run on an ARM processor, basically to run on a cell phone. Right. And that's why Windows 10 runs so good, is if you ever notice, Windows 10 front loads a lot of stuff. It does a lot of look ahead caching. It does a lot of things to make sure that you're not waiting on operations, unless they're pure IO operations where you're opening something for the first time that's never been opened before. Everything's been optimized. Even if you've opened a file before and you reboot your computer and boot it back up, you will open that same file again quicker because what it'll do is it'll index and page out the memory when you're shutting down into the page file so that it knows exactly where to recover it back into memory into the cache while you're booting the computer back up again. So Windows well, has gotten really I kinda, clever. <clears throat> I kind of hate that sometimes because there's there's times where like my my workstation at the at the studio will start acting really kind of funky. Yep. And I want to do like just a complete shutdown and, and restart the system and then it reboots and brings everything back up exactly where it was. I'm like, no, I want you to kind of not do that. I want you to just dump everything and start over. <laughs> you used to be able to hold down. I haven't tried it in a long time, but it used to be. I think you hold down the shift key. If you hold down shift key while the computer's booting, it bypasses all of the startup options and run key in the H key local machine run and startup. Well, you see, Jerry, that would make too much sense because even Microsoft turned took off the safe boot or the safe. You know, you can't even boot into safe mode in Windows 10 without like a key now. No, no, the way you booted the safe mode is really stupid. You literally just boot the computer up, and then while it's booting, just control alt delete, and then it'll try to boot again. Hit control it again half, halfway while it's booting, and then after it fails two times, it'll present you with the menu where you can do it. But there's no way to go into the menu just with F8 anymore. They they, they stopped that shit because they didn't want people like accidentally getting in there. Accidentally getting in there, which makes <laughs> troubleshooting a pain in the ass. It's so stupid. I've had to do it on this computer like three times where I boot up the computer and I basically have to fail the startup on purpose just so it'll let me into the damn uh, options menu. Oh, uh, Hob Hobsletoff says if I reboot using the command line, it won't do that. Talking about. Oh, so if you do like shut down minus R minus T zero yeah. from the command line. Yeah. Jay doesn't like the command line because he types really slow, you know, so he, he doesn't he does like the command line. <laughs> I type as slow as you drive, dude. <laughs> oh, that was, actually, that was actually a pretty damn good bird. That was a pretty good deal. Hey, hey, it's no fair. If, if, if we both got to drive our own cars on the track, that isn't fair, okay? Like a blind person could get around the Nürburgring faster in your car than I could in mine. Come on, seriously. I would take, or I, die. I would, I would race your STI and my Z. Actually, that'd be a, that would be a fair match. I'd, I'd take that action. Although my car understeers or, or, or understeers like a bitch. So I don't know if I'd want to do that. 
I'm you, I'm scared. My car, you got to commit like a bitch on a track, and look, I'm kind of scared. There's to get nothing the ass you can. Out there's speed. nothing you can tell me that will make me feel bad for you because not only do we have the Nissan challenge, we also have the Subaru challenge, all in the same group. So we've got we've got all kinds of Subarus out there doing grip with us, and I see the way they drive. You're just a pussy. I just got to set mine up. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've, have you ever been in my car when I tried to go around a corner pretty fast? Uh, yeah, I mean, but most you, of the stuff we did was straight line speed. No, right? you, you did some freeway ramps in the in the moist, but yeah, it doesn't. It just I need to get better tires on it, and the and it's not. It's set up for rally. It's not set up for street. So the thing does yeah. want to understeer really bad on the pavement, and the only way to correct that is to use the brakes to get the weight to the front. And then get the ass end all kinds of slippery all over the place. And with the short wheelbase, that's really scary in that so, car. So when I when I had the ZL1 at Button Willow, that was the second time I had taken it to the track. I did four sessions at Chuck Walla, just destroyed my best time I could do in my Z. Just absolutely like seven seconds faster, right? <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> and a, on a on a two minute track. So And that's after you've been out in the Z several times on the same track, right? I've, this is your I first had, time. I'd already had like twenty sessions in the Z at that track. Because I know what it's like to get used to a new car, and you didn't have a lot of time to even really get used to that. Nick so. went out with me. Nick went out with me in the first session on, on the ZL1. I didn't go out there and warm up. I just went out there and was like Leroy Jenkins. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Leroy Jenkins. Basically, uh, yeah. So anyway, <clears throat> um, took the took the car over to Button Willow, and I drove the first two sessions solo. My my driving instructor was uh, Stephen Doherty was was coaching someone else. And so I was like, shit, this is going to be interesting going out, learning the, learning the, the lines in this car on this track and this direction that I'd never driven before yeah. and with by myself. So I brought him out, did that. And then I did like really shitty. I did like a 209 and then like a 206. Right. Then he, I gave him the keys to the car for, for session three. Uh, oh no, I'm sorry. Session three, he coached me. And when you have a coach, it's like, you're faster, but you're still spending a lot of time kind of waiting for the instruction. Like you want their feedback. And so you kind of yeah. drive inherently slower because you're kind of absorbing information. And then the next session, you really just go and apply it. Sure. Uh, just like Dirtfish, right? And yep. so I let him drive the fourth session because I wanted to see what the car was capable of. And of course, he did like a 158 with traffic. Has and he the, ever driven one before? Or was that the first? No, it was his first time. So, wow. so we did a we did a 25 minute session, and it was really eye opening because I watched him just like each lap, like kind of analyze what the car was doing and what he wants it to do. And he's kind of learning a car he had never been in before and then watched him like just flip a switch in his brain. And literally I was sitting there like practically shit in my pants with the way he drives. But the, but here's the best thing. I, the, the session before that he coached me, then I watched him apply what he was coaching me. And then the fourth session, or I'm sorry, the fifth session, the bonus session, I just went out and dropped like another four seconds off my time down to a 201. So I went from a 209 wow. to a 201 in the same day and a track I'd never driven and a car I'd only been on track and a different track with. <clears throat> so that's impressive. But what I want, the point of this story is the car that I was battling the entire time was a fully built, uh, Hawkeye STI. Oh, wow. Okay. Literally it was a Hawkeye STI that he and I were at the 204, 205 second range. We're just literally up each other's ass. Yeah. Right. I'd point him by cause I'm like, okay, I don't, I don't want to hold you back. Then as soon as I point him by, suddenly it's like my intensity goes up. Then I'm riding up his ass, and he points me by because he's like, "Dude, get off my ass!" So we're just like leapfrogging around the track every few every few laps. We're passing. And this is like each a other. built time attack car that's got like diffuser oh. on the back, giant wing. No, not not to that level. Tires. It's actually oh, okay. he, he he actually does um, all surface. It's it's like allsurfaceracing.com or something like that. And so he does uh, this car is set up for multiple things. Like they'll set it up for oh, dirt, wow. they'll set it up for grip. The point is. At the 204, 205 range, um, he and I were battling like crazy. After seeing, after after going out with Doherty and then just sending it, like, yeah, there wasn't even a competition anymore because I dropped like another four seconds off my time. And then, but my point is, I have seen what these Subarus are capable of. So your argument holds no water, <laughs> except for the fact that you are set up for loose surface. And, and, and I weigh 320 pounds. So uh, I had a passenger too. with me every session. <laughs> well, I have a passenger with me when I don't have a passenger with me. <laughs> you, dude, you make it sound like I'm light. I am not light. It, it is a torquey car, though. I'll give you that. The, no, the I'm talking about me. My body. A lot of load. My oh, body. You. I am not that light. <laughs> <laughs> I sit in chairs and they go, ugh. <laughs> I still, I would love, I would love to get out on a track with you. One, because I'd pretty much go into it knowing I was going to lose. Because I've, I've seen the way you drive. You've got me dead to rights on pavement. You've got me dead to rights on a simulator. Mm -hmm. um 
But just after me spanking you in the dirt, I only think it'd be fair for you to just completely destroy me on a track someday. Yeah. So we got we got to make that happen. So oh, I got I got I'm gonna come down there and get a car. I got I gotta tell you offline, but I'm going back to Dirtfish. Oh, you are? It's for it's it's for a completely different sanctioning body, but they're working with Dirtfish. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Well, let me know when you're doing that, and uh, I can put you up here if you want. Yeah, I think it'd be fun. I think I think I want to get Volair out there too. Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy just to come hang out. I don't got to do shit. I just want to come hang out and watch you do do your thing. The thing is, it's going to be the all-wheel drive stuff, which is, you know, I'm going to be lost on. So No, no, you know what you're going to be surprised on is the BRZs, you had to carry your speed everywhere. Yeah. The Subarus, no. The Subarus, you literally just square turn sideways out of the corner, punch at the floor, and you're pinned to the seat. I mean, they get such good traction. When I, when I told my instructor that I'm going to need some, I'm gonna need, need some instructing to prepare for this event because it is a bit of a race. Yeah. Um, he said, what you need to learn is the zero counter method. And I was like, zero counter method? He's like, yeah, basically you, you get the car, rotate, you point the wheel, and you just hit the gas, which is exactly what you said. Where I'm That's used exactly to counter steering. And he's like, you don't counter steer with the all-wheel drive. Nope. So. Nope. The trick, with the, the trick with the Subaru is you literally go to the outside of the corner. You don't aim for the apex. You go to the outside of the corner so that you come out of it with the longest possible straightaway you can get. Yeah. And you get the car sideways and you just slide sideways majestically until you're about lined up with where you want to go. And I swear, as soon as you hit that gas pedal, that car just sinks down into the dirt about an inch or two. Yeah. Comes to a complete stop laterally and just bolts straight. Especially with the and rally tires. They're 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 yeah. designed to bite with lat with the side of the tire. Yeah, the the, gri the grip of tires, even the ones that were on our BRZs were pretty grippy, but again, we only had rear wheel drive. When you have the front pulling and the back pushing and you got all that uh, and you got a brand new set of tires on there with the really sharp edges on the grip of tread. Mm -hmm. Holy crap, man. They they hook in the dirt like you like like a normal car would on uh, on not good pavement, but like shitty pavement. You know, you actually do get a decent amount of traction, like way more than you'd think. I guarantee you when you get in, you're going to be like, wow, on the back stretch, I could hit almost 90 miles an hour in the Subaru. Yeah. When we were out there, you know, that big long stretch yep. where we were doing the slalom. Yep. You can hit 90 in the Subaru or the BRZ. We were struggling to hit like 45, 50. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a completely different game, dude. You're going to love it. And I, the Subarus steer great in the dirt. Like they oversteer like, or understeer like shit on pavement. But in the dirt, they're awesome. Al, uh, Alvaro says, are we talking about tech or what? We just spent like 45 minutes talking about ASIC miners and CPUs and stuff. And you're going to come in here and bitch. Read yeah, the IPCs. Jesus. Read the read the chat. If you're wondering, like, why is Jay being so salty? You are warned. You're going to get publicly ridiculed. You come in here and ask where the tech is. So take your thumb out your ass, turn off your device and go to school. There. Anyway. You know what you need to do is come up a day early before the event so that we can get one of the instructors up there to, to, to take you out. In the well, SDI. apparently it was Nate that tossed that told them about me. So oh, okay, okay, yeah. yeah Nate, Nate, Nate is a great instructor. Nate, Nate is amazing. That's they why just I kept did, him for myself. They just did a, a, a weekend thing last last weekend, yep. or something, um, where they basically did ride along with Mitch and ride along with Nate, and they had in car cameras and stuff. Holy shit, Nate can drive. <laughs> oh no, I've been I've been on a hot lap with uh, three of the instructors. There, Forrest DePlusi, he's not there anymore. Now he's uh, now he works on one of the crazy GRC rally drivers guys uh, crew. Although I I don't know if you heard, but GRC got canceled. Yeah. So that that sucks because of lack of uh, money and interest. Mm. Um, but uh, I was in a hot lap with him. Uh, I did one with Don Wooten when he was there, and I did one with Nate. And I have to say that out of the three, Nate was the fastest. Yeah, Nate. Like, like he's he's properly crazy. See, he'll, they, he'll had, they had in car the tunnel sideways. They had in car cameras, and they were showing um, Nate's navigator and and like the level of focus on Nate's face when the navigator's yep. calling out. I was like, he's like just he's like wide eyed and just looks like stone cold. You know yeah. what I mean? And he's fast even in a slow car. Nate drives like these sobs and shit, like these old shit buckets. He from was the driving 90s an old Volvo. The old Volvo? I, I know. The white and the red one? one. Yeah, yeah. 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 So so he always buys these little cheap. I swear to God, he doesn't spend a thousand dollars on the car uh, and then puts all the gear into it to run. But he takes these things out there and the thing is just wrapped out off the top end the entire time. Like mm -hmm. he he does not slow down. Yeah. He just he just drives that thing like he stole it. But no, he's he'd be a great one to have like sit down before you do any kind of race and give you some tips. And plus he's bulletproof. Like you put him in the passenger seat, like unless the car is like upside down and flipping over the top of a river, he's just like sitting over there chill. Yeah. Well, he was a, did you ever see the video where I, where I was in the warehouse and I'm driving the car, the, the drone video I did where I'm inside the warehouse driving the rally car and I come out and I spin the car around oh, sideways. On yeah. The, pavement, the cameraman runs and up the to it. The cameraman fell down. Yeah. He was sitting in the passenger seat and he closed his eyes just to fuck with me. Oh, jeez. He said, he said because we we're getting ready to take off or whatever, he's like, I'm just going to close my eyes. And he leans back in his chair and closes his eyes and he didn't open them. So if you watch the video, he's like sitting over there snoozing. That's funny. 
Yeah, he's cool. Yeah, I, I really want to get back up there and do the rear-wheel drive school again, only because of, of how much my skills have improved in terms of just getting the car sideways on pavement. Yeah. I would really love to do it again in dirt. So. That's true. The, the Subarus do get squirrely in the back end, though. They're not. I mean, if you get on the gas, they straighten out pretty easily. But they, they, you can still get those things sliding around really good. Yeah. And at much higher speeds. That's the other thing you might appreciate about it is the, the BRZs seem like they would slide sideways at ten miles an hour, like like nothing. The Subarus, you got to put a lot more into them to get them unsettled. So it's a lot more high adrenaline. Like I would have to say that when I went out there, I was expecting the BRZs to be a lot more dramatic than they were. It's like you actually had time to think. And the Subarus, you're you're white knuckled in a lot of the shit that you're doing out there. Yeah, it's and, and I've seen him run a BRZ against the Subaru. And I mean, the Subaru would would, would could lap the damn thing. You want to hear something? That's the speed difference. I'm seeing a bunch of people say I look disinterested when you're talking. What they don't realize is when I'm looking off to the side this way, I'm actually looking at Jerry's camera. It's that way. So I'm looking at Jerry when he's talking. You dumbasses. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> anyway. Moving. Oh my God! Why does it? Why does it? Why does everybody always got to be mean and try to create drama? I don't get that. Yeah, I don't get that. The entire internet just has been on a kick lately. Yeah. Wanted just if they can't find drama, they create it. Dude, the ZL1 was so fun on track, dude. I was, I was those first two sessions. I was basically going into the garage like with our our race group. I was like, hey, who wants to ride along? Anyone want to ride along? <laughs> Someone needs to come out and feel this thing. Like, because if I just come back and tell you how good it is, you'll be like, no, no, it's a Camaro. A- anyone who went out with me came back going, holy shit, what? <laughs> WTF. <laughs> Dude, I'm coming. I'm coming down to do it. I know. I know. I can't do it close to Mother's Day, but the next track that you do after that, let me know right we're, after Mother's Day. We're going to be going tickets. on lunch break and or lunch break, uh, summer <laughs> summer break until like September, I think. And even okay. then, I don't think I'm going to go in September because I think it's Big Willow. Um, November is the one you're going to want to go to because that's Chuck Walla. Okay. Although Button get, Willow, count, count me in. Although Button Willow would be a lot more fun because we get a lot more speed in that car in Button Willow than we do Chuck Walla. But. Oh, do they got a nice long straight? Uh, Chuck Walla has several of them. It also has uh, a lot of elevation changes. It also has blind elevation changes, um, high speed S's, and oh shit, high speed straight. Scary that's track. we're basically doing about 130 miles an hour into a non banked 90 degree left hand turn with enough speed to get back up to 130 again before we take a nice sweeping left hand turn into about a hundred mile per hour right hander that you slow down to about 30 miles an hour. So you go from about 100 to 30 while trail braking into what they call off ramp. And then again yeah. to a full throttle uh, exit into what they call cotton corners, which is like a chicane that again has an off has an off camber elevation change coming out of it into a into a flat right hander. So there's a lot of opportunity for you to just drive off track. Wow. Yeah. Well, is fun. there a lot of run out or is it a pretty. Oh, yeah. You're like, not going to hit nothing in button willow unless you get really stupid on the last turn on clockwise going into the start finish. Then there's a wall there. Yeah. Um, other than that, well, next, yeah. next time you come up here, I'll take you out to the Ridge. You haven't been out to our tracks. We have two here. We got Pacific Raceways and we got uh, the Ridge yeah. out in Shelton. They're both they're both within an hour, hour and a half of me. Um, and I'll tell you what, the Ridge has a corkscrew turn just like Laguna Seca. They actually modeled it after Laguna Seca. Oh, cool. So and so so it's I think it's only it's one of the only other tracks in the United States that has a corner like this. And it's the same blind come over the tip, aim for the trees because you can't see the track anymore because it falls that hard. Yeah. And it's it's a lot of fun, but there's tons of run out. That's why I like. So I'd, I'd even be comfortable letting you drive my Subaru out on that track. Cause it's like if you eat shit off the road, you just go out into a big dirt field. That's that's the only thing you're gonna do. Chuck Wall is a lot like that too, cause it's in the desert. It's just yeah, you just run off into a lot of fine dirt, you know. But yeah, Chuck Wall is Chuck Wall is still one of my favorite tracks. It's a momentum track, so it's just about keeping your momentum through the turns. Button Willow is a rhythm track, so if you get out of sequence in Button Willow, then you really kind of screw up the next two or three turns. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I'll have to show you on my PDR, um, which is a, the performance data recorder. So that's the, mm-hmm. the camera and telemetry built into my car, where coming out of the S's and Button Willow, uh, I curbed a little bit too hard on the left side. So it upset the car at 110 miles per hour. You see me do a 30 degree counter steer at 110 with the back end of the car coming sideways, coming out of the S's. My coach or my instructor, he didn't tell me till later that he practically shit a brick because he's like at 110 on the passenger side feeling the car go com- like just completely come off the ground on the back end. Yeah. And then it, it was at that moment, even though he's coached me now for an entire year and a half, it was at that moment where he finally, he said he felt 100% comfortable with getting in the car with me when I'm really trying to send it because he realized at that moment that I'm on top of it because the counter steer just came so natural. I didn't even realize it happened until we looked at the footage. That's funny. So, so basically, he didn't even think you were going to be able to catch it. No, it was he. 
I asked him that, and he basically was like, no, it's just as the passenger, you have that split second of wondering, like, is he going to catch it? Because the thing is, we're oversteering at that point towards a wall that's only about 30 feet away. Yeah. Well, hey, I'll tell you what. Next time you go to Dirtfish, ask Nate why why he lets me uh, why he lets me drive with one hand. Because mm-hmm. that's 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 like a bad rule there. They yeah. teach a dirt face. You're always supposed to have your hands on the wheel. You only take your hand off the wheel to shift and then back to the wheel, right? Uh-huh. But when I'm driving, I'm all like, meh, meh, you know, like yeah. this because my belt, my belly's in the way, right? Yeah, yeah. So I, so I, so I'm always like doing the same. Well, there was more than a couple times Nate and I were out there where I was like on the third day doing the high speed shit through the woods where I was getting dangerously close spinning going into the river and i kept just magically saving the car because my instincts are just like ah, 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 this, yeah. way, this, way, this way and i get the shit back and he's just like whatever just keep doing it like it seems to work for you <laughs> whatever and it was pretty funny because like from there on out all the classes that i did there the instructors were all like no no it's cool that's a bad habit but you seem you seem to do a lot better with it so we're just gonna go ahead and let you keep doing it yeah no but I, I don't think i'd get away with that shit on pavement i was pavement scared away i was scared when i Okay, so the first session with the ZL1, like full transparency, my car costs seventy three thousand dollars. It is not a cheap car. I make like I make monthly payments on that. I can't afford to just go buy that car with cash. So I'm going okay. I got a car payment. Insurance ain't going to cover that thing if it gets fucked up. And yes, of course there is track insurance, but it's like four hundred dollars a session or four hundred dollars a track day. I'm like, you know how quickly that'll add up. Yeah, it's a lot cheaper than not having to pay your car, pay your car off. Yeah, I know, I get it. But anyway, <laughs> that first session, it's just like okay. Here we go. Because it's not just me. It's not just what am I able to do with the car? Am I going to hit something? Am I going to go off? It's is yeah, someone people going to hit you? Is someone going to hit me? It, yep. Am I going to slow down for the high speed braking zone and the guy behind me suddenly has got no brakes? You know what I mean? Because that's yeah. that's or legit. his brakes aren't as good as yours, right? Because you got fucking epic brakes and sticky tires. What if the dude behind you is like an, a golf doing a buck ten with like you know? But you see drum brakes. But you see any what I'm about to say. Anyone in chat uh, who who does HPDE or Time Attack will will know is. You don't jam the brakes. You you don't you don't drive into the braking zone super hot and then just jam the brakes because that upsets the car. It's 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 a it's a squeeze and a slow release with the brakes. So I've been behind people that suddenly are just jamming on the brakes, and I'm like, holy shit! Why are you over slowing the car like this? Because they 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 get scared going into that turn. They're not comfortable trail braking, or maybe the car just isn't very good at trail braking. Like the Z is terrible at trail braking. It wants to spin when you do it. Uh, yeah. It's not about how much can you jam on the brakes in the turn. It's about how smooth can you transition from from acceleration to deceleration into turning. And the ZL1 is actually great at it because it, its braking bias is so good, it loves to trail brake. So I can carry a lot of that speed and bleed a lot of it off with the turn rather than the brakes. So it's just about transitioning that momentum forward on the front wheels to keep yep. them from understeering squeezing off the brake slowly as I'm turning the wheel. And then, so I've got a little bit of trail braking and I've got just momentum and the lateral G's slowing down the car and then easing onto the throttle coming out of it. Cause the other thing with the ZL1 is if you just, even with the tires heated up, you just mash the gas that you're, you're kind of fucked. The car wants to go around even, right. Even with the tires at full temp in track mode, with the trash control set to race, which is the least amount of intervention possible, when you watch my PDR, you see the you see the traction and stability light coming on constantly, just constantly coming on. Even at 100 miles per hour on a straight line, you'll see the traction control light come on because it's trying to spin the tires at 100 miles yeah, an hour. Yeah, it's rear wheel drive and 700 horsepower. There ain't nothing that's going to put that power down unless you're doing, what, 100 miles an hour? Yeah, well, you'll, you'll see there's times where we're doing 100 and, and or even 130, you'll see the traction light come on. Yeah, I know the Dodge uh, Charger Hellcat that I drove in. We were doing 80 on the freeway, and he stomped it to the ground, and the traction control was going blah, 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 because yep. it, it, was, it was still breaking the tires loose. But I, I didn't figure your car would do that with all the downforce. My car doesn't have that much downforce. It just doesn't make a lot of lift. Oh, really? Oh, for some reason, I thought that the Camaro had, like, crazy downforce. Only 300, only 300 pounds of rear downforce with that spoiler at 155. That's not a lot of oh, downforce. Oh, shit, that's nothing. The yeah, thing that's is, nothing. The thing is, the splitter and stuff on the car are so functional, it actually creates very little lift. So, yeah. let's put it this way. Um, yeah, guys, car talk, deal with it. So, if we are dealing with a car that lets a lot of air under the front of the car, right? It's going to pick up. Yeah. The more air cushion you have under a car, the more it's going to push up on the car. So let's say you make 500 pounds of downforce, but you got 250 pounds of lift. You've got effectively right. 250, 250 pounds of downforce. Right. The thing with this car is it makes practically zero lift at speed. So all the downforce is usable downforce. It, so what you really notice in the terms instead of in terms of braking stability and high speed cornering is the fact that the air cut cushion under the car is not fighting you. 
Gotcha. And it's super noticeable. Like the Z, the Z's got functional arrow with the Nismo, but the Z feels like it has a ton of lift versus the Camaro. Oh wow. Yeah. Does uh does the, so does the Camaro have like the full underbody plating that makes it like completely flat underneath? Only the front half of the car and then the sides there's 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 skid not skid pans but they're flat covers okay. like on each side of the of the uh, tunnel where the drive shaft is and then and it stops in front of the back wheels behind it it's just a standard diffuser oh interesting okay yeah okay because I whole, know a lot of the modern cars they're like doing the full underbody coating now where you have to like drop the whole pan out to but do the anything whole, the whole front of the car especially from the front axles forward is completely skid panned and aero panned uh, with splitters and stuff. And the thing is, if you look under the front splitter, in front of the front tires, I'll have to show you a picture. And you can actually find these uh, these online, actually. Um, if you look at pictures of the ZL1 1LE and underneath the car, in front of the front tires, there are actually channels that curve the air to the side of the car. So the air that makes it underneath the front of the car never even uh -huh. hits the front of the wheel. It gets scooped out to the side in front of the wheel. So the air is not even being upset by the by the rotation of the tire and that flat surface of the tire is not hitting the oh, air. Oh, I see. It's so it's coming in the away. front and it's going, it's going out the sides like at, this? Exactly. That probably keeps the car pretty stable at high speeds too, right? Because that's going to help keep it centered. Well, I could say it feels pretty damn stable and the only way to know is to take them off and then do the same thing, but I really don't want to. All right, be honest. What's the <laughs> fastest you've had the car up in a straight line? Come on! I don't really want to. I don't really want to say. Come on! Come on, man! <laughs> I, I, I told you. I, I said. I said publicly. I got my car up to one sixty-seven. Okay. Well, I haven't been that fast in my car because I don't have any <laughs> long open roads like you do here. <laughs> but I will tell you this: from one, from getting on the freeway, yeah, to the next exit, I did one fifty-five. And the next that's, exit, that's awesome. and the next exit is like uh, two thirds of a mile. So no, not even a half mile. So it's it's just over a quarter mile. The car does 124 yeah. and a quarter. And, hey, what did yeah. you say your car weighed again? What's the what's the curb weight? 3,800 and change. So 3,800. So you're 400 pounds heavier than me, and you've got over twice the horsepower. Mm, well, so, I'm like I'm like 580 ish crank. Or no, I'm sorry, not crank. Uh, wheel. I'm I'm. The stage, oh, that's true because mine is wheel because I did the dyno thing. So yeah. if you're 580 wheel and I'm th so I'm about 333 horsepower wheel yeah so so yeah okay so so not not quite double but still for 400 pounds i mean your power per ton is massively higher than mine right and the aerodynamics of my car are improved over yours yeah plus your your rear wheel drive wow you have that much drivetrain loss it's On about rear wheel it's drive? about 15 percent actually that doesn't sound too bad wow it's just it's just hard to think of that because like at 700 horsepower you wouldn't think that you'd be down you know 150 ish horsepower well, yeah, I mean, it's 15%, so 700 times yeah. 0.85, right? I mean, that's 595. Jeez, okay. So my goals, with, my goals with the car, and, and, and that was the biggest complaint people had in the car, the car video, was like, you say stage one and stage two, but you don't say what those are, and I don't know, this isn't need for speed, why are you yeah. using stage? It's like, they're legitimately called stages. But anyway, um, stage one is the, the, there's different stage ones. It depends on the tuner you go with. But the stage, stage one is basically simple stuff, like an intake, um, the and the intake makes a huge difference on these cars because they're extremely baffled to make the supercharger silent, uh, yep. which affects flow big time. But in my my particular stage one is the um, the the Rotofab intake, the ported throttle body from Mamo Motorsports, which is basically a, a, like an ARP port or ARP, mm -hmm. um, yeah, a, a, a or whatever. T Tony Mamo did the port, and then there was some there's there was a defect in my car that kind of followed over from the previous gens where do you know anything about root style uh or twin chargers yeah yeah okay yep so you know the the blow off valve slash recirc valve is built into the manifold itself yeah there is a there is a spring and a, and a set screw that are designed to you know let them open up under certain pressure so mm -hmm. the pressure overcomes the spring it opens up it bleeds off whatever excess psi so my car is supposed to make like 10 pounds of boost I was only seeing 7.5 pounds, and I'm like, what the hell is going on here? So I, I found a thread on Gen 6 or Camaro6.com about how the, a lot of these set screws were set too far in, which was keeping that that uh, waste or not wastegate, but that recirc valve sli yeah. slightly open all the time. So you were never hitting your boost. I target. was never hitting my max boost. I went in there, adjusted it, backed it off to where it's supposed to be, went out and tested it, immediately saw 10 pounds of boost. And now anytime I hit, I, I go full throttle at 70 miles an hour on the freeway, I leave black patches on the ground because I spin the tires at 70 miles an hour. 
So that alone, I don't know how much power it made up for, but I could tell that something wasn't right because my car always ran ridiculously rich, stupid rich. Like you could almost see unburned flu uh, fuel just spitting out of the tailpipe when I would rev. Because it. it was accounting for that fuel, but the it was accounting for there. the air that yeah. wasn't there. Right. So as soon as I adjusted that, my tailpipe start stopped turning liquidy black, and the power went through the roof. So yeah, that's awesome. Just make sure you don't pull it back it off so much that you're running lean because running lean is no, like the worst. No, you back thing you it off. You back it off too far, then it just the wastegate opens later and the tune is all jacked up. So all I did was back it off so that when the the spring is completely like under its own tension, yeah, to where the set screw is like a paper's a paper's thickness off of it, which is the yeah. way it's supposed to be. You know, I'm really surprised that that thing doesn't have uh, an electronic solenoid operating. And it's mechanical. That. That's that's interesting. I mean, I mean, that's that's how they used to be done. But it's like yeah. now everybody uses the boost uh, solenoid because H and M uh, Kishna says yawn when your kids hit 140 to 160. Let me know. Is that as fast as you can go? If so, then I'm sorry. I'm yeah. sorry if that's all you got, dude. Yeah, my 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 car at 167. It's it's done. It won't. It doesn't want to go no more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but at 167, my car also turns into single engine Cessna. So my car, so I don't, my I don't car's to top speed that. is drag limited at 190. Yeah, I guarantee you, my car at 167 feels a lot more scary than Jay's car at 190, whatever. Like I guarantee yeah. it. His car at 190 is probably just like cruising straight as arrow down the road, really connected to the pavement. My Subaru, no, my Subaru is like literally feeling like it's doing this, <laughs> like it's a boat. It's pretty scary. Yeah, well, yeah, I think you you were in it when I, did, I think it did 140, 140 or 145. I can't remember. I think it was 145. And we had the windows down. I thought my rear window was going to blow out, dude. The pressure. Wes, Wes CH says H and K N Kishna. H and N Kishna. Not everyone has a car that can do 140, so stop sounding like a badass. My Altima did 140, so. <laughs> I mean. Dude, my Corolla did 115, <laughs> and it was bouncing off the rev limiter. But with the turbo, it got there really fast. Uh, DME <laughs> Demetsis says gear limited as well. Yeah, he's true. That's one of the, yeah. that he's right. That's one of the differences with my six speed manual versus the standard ZL1 six speed manual is I have a shorter six gear so that it can pull it better. Oh, um, cool. With the additional downforce in the shorter six gear is why the standard ZL1 is actually faster in a, in a top speed than my car. Yeah. And the truth is, I mean, there's like a handful of tracks in the world where you'd ever achieve that top speed and actually gain a noticeable advantage. Yeah, like you're, you're not you're I mean, God, what is Chuck Walla? Like, what's the top speed you've been on that track? Have you data logged it to see what your top speed is out there? Which track? Uh, what's the fastest track? Fastest well, track you've Button been on is the ZL1. fast Button Willow. But like 129, 130 is as far as we as fast as we can get in the straight. But if you look at the if you look at the video, like it's not a very long straight. See, I'd love to see what your car did out of the ridge because the ridge has got a almost a mile straight at the bottom. Oh, wow. So in the mile straight, my car, before I break to the corner, I hit just about 140 um, in the Subaru. So in the in the in the GTRs were flying by me, like halfway down the track. The GTRs are going by me like I'm standing still. Yeah. So I'd be surprised because your car, your car is faster than a GTR. Stock, a stock GTR. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Not the, the, the Nismo one's stupid expensive. Anyways, did anybody actually buy one of those? Like, yeah, I've seen them at the track. I've seen a few of them at the track, actually. But yeah, because aren't they, isn't it like the Nismo version, like 40 grand more or something? It's like just a little bit more power. 170,000. Fucking A, man. It's like, why would anybody more. buy that? Just buy the stock one and, like, put put 50 grand into it. And it'll be 10 times the car. Yeah. it's. Oh, my God. I don't get it. You know, the thing the thing about cars that, and I, I swear to God, I feel like I'm such a minority. Why can't people just be like, oh, yeah, cool car. You know, why, why do people always have to be like, fuck your car, I'd rather have a yacht yacht. It's like, no one really cares about what you'd rather have. I'm, I'm serious. No one cares about what someone else would rather have. See, the thing is, it's like PC. There are so many different options out there. Yeah. There, There's always going to be something for you and something that's not for you. It's just, it's the entitled little shits that constantly feel like they've got to go out there and tell everyone about how they don't want this and they don't want that and they don't like this and they don't like that. No one gives a shit what you don't like. No one gives yeah. a shit. No one gives a shit what I don't like. No one gives a shit what you don't like, Jerry. I sure as shit don't give a shit what you don't like and vice versa. Why can't the rest of the like, world be like, like that? I like all cars. I like all cars, even shitty cars. Like, I have I have had some of the most fun in my life driving my old piece of shit 1976 Ford Courier. 
That thing couldn't go 55 miles an hour down the freeway. But I'll tell you what, if you found a dirt road, you could jump that thing Dukes of Hazard style and not give three you shits jumped, about it. You jumped the freaking like <laughs> median with me in the car when you picked me up from the airport. <laughs> I was did. like, I what the that. hell? I remember that. And we were we were booking. Yeah, we were. We were balls when we clipped that thing. Oh, my God. See, but luckily, okay, if you guys, suspension if you go, if you guys, this was short. This was a few years ago, like the second time I'd ever been to Jerry's house. Yeah. And this was like right after Jerry had made the transition from like his lower high, ride height and stuff. And, and he raised the car and got it all set up for dirt. Cause you were getting ready to do yeah. like the, the, the dirt fish thing where they were like, bring your own car and go and run. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The underbody plating and raised up yeah. suspension. Yeah. So he picks me up from the, the airport and Jerry is not what you would call a slow driver. He's a lot like me. He's like, he drives his car. Like, like it's like, he's all having fun. Yeah. Right. And he's not being like really stupid. Although this story might sound like he's being really stupid, but yeah, I'll admit that one was a little much. So he's, he's that guy that's like the first time I ever rode with him was like, okay, uh, I'm probably going to die on this trip, you know? But then I got to know, know Jerry's driving. I'm like, okay, Jerry, Jerry is not incompetent behind the wheel. So I started getting a little bit more comfortable and I'm on my phone, like looking at Twitter and stuff. We're leaving Seattle. He's getting on the freeway and there's a merging lane that has to merge left and there's a bunch of traffic there. Jerry decides he doesn't have to, he doesn't want to wait for traffic. So he just decides to to full, full throttle down the merge lane into the shoulder. And I'm looking at this going, we're literally about to drive off the freeway. What the hell is happening here? I look up and I don't even react. I'm just like, okay, I'm sure he knows what he's doing. There's like a little berm at the end of the road right there, like where it merged over. It's, it's just like the rough, soft shoulder. And yeah. there's like a little berm and then a ditch underneath it. Jerry freaking launched it off the berm and landed it on the freeway and cleared the whole ditch. I'm like, what the hell did I just experience? <laughs> I like cut it. Yeah, we went into the dirt and just cut across. Yeah, but just, you jumped we it first. Ass. Like you yeah, jumped we it first. You you cleared like the dip. We didn't even go into the ditch. You didn't even feel the ditch. Like we no. were we went right over it like glass. Yeah. No, that 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 car that car can handle a beating. And and my and my biggest shock was just how like smooth it took it. Yeah, you know the person behind us was like shitting a brick too. Oh yeah, I'm sure. Like, I'm sure it looked like they, it looked like Thelma and Louise. Let's be honest. Yeah, because they were trying to out accelerate us. They did. They, they they could tell we were trying to get in front of them. So they're yeah. like, oh yeah, we'll show them or whatever. And I was like, oh fuck it, dude, I'll take it in the dirt. I don't care. It's it's a dirt car. We can do this. Yeah. You can <laughs> you can always tell when you get ready to do a high speed run with Jerry because he'll he'll look in the mirror and see if there's anyone behind him. He'll kind of look out <laughs> ahead of him, and then he'll just stop talking. And then you hear. And then Jerry kind of gets like this much more intense, like look on the wheel. And then he just, he did, he, you know, you're going to go fast because Jerry stops talking to be yeah, honest. My attention increases by a huge <laughs> magnitude when I'm going really fast. Like I, I don't, I, I can't just sit there and do like 140 miles an hour and have a conversation with you. Like I'm, yeah. I'm focused on deer and shit jumping out in front of me. So the biggest, um, the biggest thing yeah. I just, the reason why I'm just like talking about how, why do people always have to shit on other people's cars and this and that, I guess it's because most of these people most of these people don't even have the car they would rather have. Like they're like, "Oh, yeah. that car sucks. I'd rather have Yada Yada." The point is, you probably don't have anything to brag about anyway. But the I, that's why I don't like the show car crowd. That's why I don't like a lot of a lot of these like societies. Just like, okay, yeah. my Z will never have a society sticker, stuff like that on there, because these people just do nothing but talk down others to talk yep. their car up. When you go to the track, when you're with the track crowd nobody talks shit to each other nobody comes over and is like oh well i've got that 911 gts over there so your camaro is a big pile of shit no they'll come over and be like yeah i got that 911 gts over there you really shocked the shit out of me what is this you know what i mean they they don't yeah. they don't just oh, a little american piece of shit i mean you've got their you've got the little racing clubs and they'll all kind of hang out but i can't even tell you like how many gt350 r and gt350 owners have come over to me and been like dude I've heard, I've seen these, but I've never seen one in person. This is badass. And I'm like, yeah, what do you got? And they're like, oh, the 350R. I'm like, dude, let's go look at your car. And we'll just sit there and, and just, and talk and compare it. And yeah. never sit there and just put each other down. That is why I love the racing crowd. That's that's what I'm more addicted to at the yeah. track than the actual driving, is just getting to see so many of these cars that you only read about and you only hear about, you see on on, on Top Gear and, and the, the Grand Tour. And you get to see them in their element. Which is why so many people come over to me with the ZL1 and they're like, wow, you're actually tracking it. That's awesome because that's what the car was built for, you know? And when I was at the at Buttonwillow, there was a guy there that had a blue one. And he came over and was talking to me and we were kind of comparing like driving style. We're like, oh, we found it does this. It's better under this. Oh, yeah, it's cool. I'm going to try that. And then we actually improved on each other's times by just talking to each other about the car and like what we've experienced. 
you know, so well, that's the difference between people that are passionate about cars and passionate about cars and driving. Yeah. Like if, yeah. if you're passionate about driving, like anybody will tell you, even race car drivers will say it's challenging as fuck to get like a Mazda MX-5 around a track, but they still want to do it because it's dude, challenging. Jerry, I'm, I kid you not. You can find the comment on my video with the Z01. There's a guy that legit was like, this car sucks. I'd rather have a 458 Italia. It's like, what the fuck is wrong with you? You just took a car that is like five times more expensive and said you'd rather have that than mine. You sure as yeah. shit better want that more than mine if, if that's what you're into. <laughs> you should have replied back to him and been like, I want a, I want a, B a Bugatti. Uh, what's the new one? The, uh, oh, the not new, the, not the Veyron, but the new one. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, the yeah. Chiron. The, the Chiron. Chiron. Yeah. I want the yeah, Bugatti yeah. Chiron. And just fucking one up each other, each comment. Yeah. yeah, I don't I don't get people like that, but I know I I even in driving matters like when I went out for my track day at the Ridge, it was my first time ever on a track. Right. In my Subaru. Did anyone, make, I got you, my did anyone make but did anyone make you feel bad? No, not at all. Everybody was like super, super inviting. But I had a guy in a freaking Honda CRX just fuck me up like mm -hmm. the dude, the dude, I'd lose him on the straightaway. And I'm like, yeah, I got that guy. And then after like three turns, he'd be right on my ass and I'd have to get over and let him by so they wouldn't flag me. Are you ready for this? And then I'd catch him on the straightaway, go blow him by him. And then I wouldn't even make it two turns. He'd be back on my ass. and I'd let him in front hey, of me again. Hey, I'm not I'm not ashamed to admit this. In my ZL1 1 LE, I pointed by a yellow Civic EX or not EX, but a, a, a hatch, a Civic, a yellow <laughs> Civic hatch that was not boosted. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god but that's these, because these guys are just crazy because you drive it to the limit right because it was driver versus driver it wasn't honda yeah. versus camaro very true very true anyway oh on that note guys it's time to go thanks for hanging out with us today if you guys are uh, joined us late it wasn't all car talk we actually talked a lot about asic we mining did. we talked about what's changing with ethereum i even told yep. you guys where you could find a 1080 ti at at msrp <laughs> LN, ln2 records and we talked about ln2 we talked about cpu instructions per clock versus cycles yep. and and megahertz, uh, bitch. megahertz. Yeah. it megahertz to talk about it but anyway, hurts. um yeah so there was obviously some tech in this one but th I'm, it was thanks for putting up with this show today because i am at home obviously and uh, we were having some technical difficulties as you can see we are out of sync and all that but we figured either deal with this or get no show so well, i'm glad you decided to do the show today i had fun yeah it's fun i also am wondering why we have 2488 people in here and only 398 likes i mean what is yeah what the fuck guys? what do you Seriously, have to do to smash the like i mean it People, all you gotta do is click a button. I mean, what do we have to do to incentivize the button click? You gotta do this. You gotta push button. Crush the like. Crush the like. Crush the like. Crush the like. That doesn't look like you're crushing the like. It looks like you're loving the like. I am good at it these days. I haven't get my testosterone injection. Testosterone. All right, I'm gonna run that outro and then I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go buff some pain again. That's not a euphemism. Sounds good. I am going to buff some paint. That is a euphemism. <laughs> the outro is already going. Thank you for watching Tech Talk number 159. And uh, we did talk about tech, if you guys are wondering. And uh, some cars, because they're technology, too. You guys all have a nice uh, Thursday night. I'm going to go to the gym. <laughs> is that a new no, really, is, that, is that a new restaurant? <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs>